say I can't thank you enough for taking one of your the last precious evenings of summer uh, to spend it with us tonight as we tackle one of the most complex issues that communities are facing across the nation. Um, I'm not going to take time right now to dig into the root causes of what makes someone lose their home. There are many and some are quite nuanced. But one thing that they all have in common is that it's traumatic to lose the keys to a locked door and security for yourself and your loved ones. As an elected official, this is made even more tragic when we know that we're living in one of the wealthiest nations in the world. We've convened tonight, we've been convened tonight by the Thurston Thrives leadership to start out, um, start an out, sorry, I'm using someone else's glasses. These are not my glasses. I can't find mine, so I was like, ugh. So, we've, we've been convened tonight by the Thurston Thrives leadership to start an out of the box discussion on solutions. So what's the best solution to someone that's living unsheltered? You could probably say it all together, a home. home. Thanks, Trudy. <laughs> of course, if, we're, if it were just that simple, it would have been solved by now, by bigger cities, with millions more dollars at their disposal. Olympia is just a few thousand people larger than Lacey at this point. And Olympia is just roughly twice as big as Tumwater, and Tumwater is about three times as big as Yelm. Anybody from Yelm here tonight? Anybody make it up? JW! Foster in the house. We don't have the resources of a Seattle, which is roughly seven times larger than all of the incorporated cities in Thurston County. But even Seattle doesn't have it figured out, right? Even with what they have. So that's why you're all here tonight. We can do better. We have to do better. And we're going to need every innovative idea to make that happen. So now I'd like to introduce Thurston County Commissioner Bud Blake. Together we served on the founding Community Council of Thurston Thrives, and he'll share more about that organization and one of their strategy maps. Before you leave tonight, we hope that you'll be deeply engaged in the power of collective impact and understand what that can mean for public health outcomes and housing is certainly a public health outcome. So thanks again for being here tonight, and I'm here's Bud Blake. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Mayor Shelby. Um, I'm Bud Blake, um, County Commissioner, uh, the Chair of the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of Health, and it is a public health issue as far as housing. Um, but I'm gonna uh, take us down the road of a Thurston Thrives uh, umbrella and how that works. Uh, not to lose you, so I'm just going to throw some acronyms out there and start off with the coordinating council. We have about 28 people that sit on that board. It meets monthly, and David chairs it many times, and we rotate through in terms of those who, uh, who, who run it. But it's a whole host of people from business, philanthropy, uh, government, and um, those more importantly, eight representatives from action teams. So there's the coordinating council at the top, 28 people, and there's eight action teams underneath that, if you will, or in the hierarchy of that. And then we have children, uh, law and justice, uh, clinical, and what have you, and scores, uh, those other seven teams. Well, the team that I chair is called the Housing Action Team, and HAC for short, right? And it's funny to have that acronym because you can play with the Dr. C stuff and do that kind of stuff, but we're super serious about the housing and what we do for it. It's been formed for the, the HAC's been uh, ongoing for the last four years, and uh, we started off with just a handful of people. Uh, and now it's up to a point that where we are uh, moving in a new direction as far as some of the things we do. Uh, under the HAT, um, and the HAT meets monthly and there's about uh, 20 to 30 people every single month that come to that, that meeting. And it's uh, uh, representations from the cities, um, those who are private interests, uh, um, those who have been homeless before. So we're just a whole host of people at the HAT. But there's three teams that I want you to draw your attention to on each side. And I'll go kind of in reverse order, uh, not least important, but the last one I'm gonna land on is the blue team. So we start off with the green team. The green team is the green and healthy rentals. And Elisa has that team, and she is absolutely marvelous in helping out with landlord disputes uh, with the tenants and weatherization. It's kind of those are the two themes to help um, a person stay in a particular apartment, or trailer, what have you and so that they do not become homeless or something inside that house or trailer or apartment causes them to become ill and where they lose their, their job 
who become homeless in that sense. So she does a wonderful job. There's about seven to eight people on that team, and they meet uh, every two months because it's a smaller team and they got a little bit more, a bit more flexibility. The other team we do color coding is for sure is the red team. It's also the uh, homeless housing hub. And Derek sitting here, he, he chairs that. And they meet monthly also um, in conjunction with the hat, hat meeting. Um, and they do a lot of other things that you would need to have as far as activism and advocacy and a lot of uh, coordination between the nonprofits that, and other entities that here represent the homeless in terms of um, putting a roof over someone's head. And the other thing you should know about the uh, Triple H, as we call it, uh, HHH, is they're also a part of the continuum of care. They represent Thurston County and they reach up and out to the state and have our voice for Thurston County um, and speak on that on behalf of Thurston County and the housing action team for advocacy and activism and funding and all those things that the state affords down to uh, counties and specifically the Thurston County. So it has a multiple purpose role and we have about uh, 20 or 30 people that meet every monthly, every meet monthly on that. But you can see how that tied to the green team and now here comes the blue team which is called the new affordable housing. Uh, new affordable construction, my bad. And so uh, that has uh, uh, two sub teams underneath that. And I'll just stick with one, it's called incentivized housing. And in that, it's kind of a think tank group of, of uh, about 20, 15 to 20 people that meet um, on a monthly basis. I say that on monthly because all this is synchronized for the housing action team to meet and then the other ones meet sub, 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 sub to that, right? So um, the blue team, uh, is a think tank, pretty much. And so one of the things we came up with about two years, we come up with a lot of things. Some of them die on, not die on spot, die on the place, die on spot. Uh, but the other one was the pipeline. And so the pipeline um, is no grandiose idea. It's just good, solid money that you can have assurances that a certain number of people qualify, put shovel in the ground, some sort of housing that happens every four, two to four to five years either the, uh, new construction or converting a commercial building or uh, some sort of hotel uh, into a affordable housing of some sort. The other thing was, is that we come up with a tool is the HAM. And that's kind of a funny acronym also with a hat and a HAM when you put those together. But that's called the affordable housing model. And that's um, kind of Zach's um, thing in terms of other people were helping to build that. And so over the last four, five, six months, we've been putting that through the test. And that's what you're gonna see here tonight. And that affordable housing model has been uh, a way to help relieve some of the pressures of market rate housing and bring more affordable housing into the inventory. And so with that, I'll just kind of stop right there and tell you that's what we do with the housing action team, that whole uh, hierarchy of the three teams. And we meet monthly and we invite anybody to come because it really does make a difference and we've made a difference. And we have a strategy map. We follow that just religiously month to month, uh, green, blue, and red, each other have their code to follow. And each year, each month, uh, each once a month, um, we go over it, but once a year we update it so that we look obviously for new funding, and new funding models to go along with that to support it. Um, but it's absolutely exciting to have the Housing Action Team under the Thurston Thrives. And then we talk regularly with the coordinating council that I mentioned earlier. So this has this body of people that are very much involved uh, in day-to-day, month-to-month, and year-to-year actions to make sure we get some of the most critical things uh, as far as health, and that's a house or a roof over someone's head. So with that in mind, uh, I think I turn it over to David, and thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, for uh, kicking things off and your support and convening of the activity. Here, I'm going to camp right here because I do have a, a, some notes, and I want to make sure I stay on task. I'm David Schaffer. I'm the President and CEO of the Thurston County Chamber, and Tonight I get a, it's a privilege to wear uh, the hat of uh, the chair of the Coordinating Council of Thurston Thrives, as well as I am a facilitator, moderator, chief cat herder to make sure our program uh, moves through the evening in an efficient manner. Uh, you know, the lack of housing in our community, and for that matter, as a national dilemma, challenge, problem, is really significant and it reverberates throughout communities and we see it in our community uh, the ripple effects and, and how it impacts individual lives their disposable income uh, a variety of health issues and it is a fundamental core 
issue that as a community we need to address and figure out what our strategies are as a community and how we come together collectively to have impact on the housing issue. So what are you going to have as expectations tonight? Well, I'm not sure what your expectations are, but let me lay out what the planning committee's expectations were and what might be some takeaways for you. The intent is to share information with you, including the problem statement of the lack of supply and its impacts on our housing affordability and our community. Uh, we will have some deliberate conversations with elected officials. And those of you who are here today that aren't elected officials, you are here because you've been identified as key components for the conversation, whether you're from the private sector, whether you are uh, staff people uh, within municipalities, you're here because we need your support and assistance. And finally, we're gonna share the outputs that uh, occur today. We're gonna uh, memorialize those, make sure that we highlight the key elements and create a digestive type package for you to continue the conversation and the work. So on the expectation side, housing and of course homelessness, but housing and homelessness, really complex issues, really challenging issues. Uh, we're only gonna scratch a little part of the surface of that, that issue, but it's a great start and it's a starting point. So there may be a third housing summit, there may be a fourth housing summit, there may be a fifth, there may be convening routinely of the community on figuring out how we're gonna address the multitude of the, the issues with respect to housing. The format, we have some presentations, we have a facilitated discussion. Both of those items are to provide some context and background and some information to kind of get some of your thoughts and juices flowing. We'll have the focused roundtable conversation, so you're at specific tables, and we'll have those being facilitated, uh, which will create, I, I am assured, uh, that we'll have some robust dialogue and conversations. And so with that, is there, we'll just throw it open. First off, feel free to get more food, and is there any questions that uh, uh, you may have as the audience about this evening? Oh, look at that. That was a little risk of myself to open that up for a question. So with that, though, it is a pleasure to really get things started um, with Ted Kelher from, ooh, hey, did we get a little more juice there? How's that? Better? I guess I gotta get a, one inch from my mouth. Okay, it's a pleasure to have Ted Kelher, Manager Director, Housing Assistant Unit for the Department of Commerce as part of our uh, presenters. He has been with the Department of Commerce since 1994 and manages the Homeless Housing and Assistant Act, including the implementation of the state's Homeless Housing Strategic Plan. Ted will, Ted will help provide some insight on housing and the housing ecosystem. So with that, Ted, it's yours. Great, thank you for that introduction. Again, Ted Kelleher, Department of Commerce. <laughs> and um, so I'm gonna go through a lot of slides tonight. There's a, I, everything I say, you know, it's been honed over time and a lot of it comes from uh, in these sorts of engagements around the state. And so there's not, probably not the best format and time today to do a lot of back and forth, but to the extent you see something, a slide or something I say and it doesn't quite ring true, don't hesitate to follow up with me and we can dig a little deeper and then I can have a better answer and better data for the next time I do that and get better, better understanding so we can all really make progress on this issue. So again, to Ted Kelleher, Department, I work at the Department of Commerce. Department of Commerce, through a long political history, um, manages the housing assistance in the state of Washington. Um, So, just indulge me for a second here. You know, my, most of what we do at the Department of Commerce is not to think about these sorts of issues. We manage money and the strategic plan. And one thing that I often hear in the media and other places, and I don't blame people necessarily for this, but I just want to clarify that Washington State, um, we're very, very transparent when it comes to, like, where did the money go? I often hear that, where did the money go? I hear that in the media. Washington State is arguably the number one state when it comes to having a transparent accounting at a project level of where the money goes, what the performance is, writing performance-based contracts, et cetera. I don't know how we can make this presentation available, but there's links in here. If you're ever curious where the money went, there's uh, 
links where you can dig into the report cards. I have a number of states coming to Washington regularly asking us, looking to adopt the best practices that we have, including, for instance, Utah last week traveled to Washington to come learn about how we do performance-based contracting, how we transparently account for all the money, not only state money, local county money, city money, federal money, all the money on the outcomes associated with that money. So this is one way of saying actually that if housing in if housing affordability and homelessness was connected to if, if it was just a matter of better performance management transparency, we would have very little homelessness, but clearly that's not what's going on because we're doing really well in that area. So, rents increasing in Washington. This is um, Zillow data, which I use is not super accurate, but it's very timely as opposed to the census data. You can see this from a 2011 baseline, rents going up, up, up. This isn't news to anyone. It's plateaued a little bit, so there's some hope that maybe we've reached the end but, of this cycle anyway, but it, you know, this, is, this is very high. And the fear is, is that maybe this plateaus for a while, but like the Bay Area, we start ticking up and eventually 10, 20 years, you know, it's the sort of situation where someone earning a six-figure income is technically low income when it comes to housing affordability. And that's what we really want to avoid. And I'm really glad to see so many people turned out on a Wednesday night to really dig into that so we don't end up in that situation. Here's King County, same dynamic. Whatcom County, so you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's Amazon or something. Well, there's no Amazon in Whatcom County. So, and they have a very similar dynamic. Uh, Spokane County, again, same dynamic. Thurston County, don't need to tell you this. Rents going up, 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 up from 2011. From, uh, you know, 1300 to 1600. And one thing that, you know, one, one sort of critique is, well, okay, the center, center cities around the world and in Washington and the country are becoming more expensive. What about the periphery areas? People, you know, with lower incomes, they could move to lower, per, lower income periphery areas, more affordable areas. But you, we're seeing these increases everywhere. Moses Lake, I pulled Yelm because we're in Thurston County here. Um, here, one of the, you know, in terms of the dynamic job center of Seattle King County, um, having access to those jobs and services and education, et cetera. This is the ends of the sound transit line. Okay, people maybe can't afford to live in Seattle. Maybe it's not appropriate given their income. But, but the same dynamic in uh, Everett, Tacoma, and Lakewood. You're seeing the same thing. You're just seeing a real problem with affordability. So, what the reason I'm standing here is because, again, Reducing the number of people um, experiencing homelessness is that's the bottom line of what my position is. And when we were, this is Washington State, this is total homelessness, this is unsheltered homelessness, which is maybe the red line, which is more important to look at. We were like, oh, we're doing great stuff. This is the Homeless Act in 2006. It's coming down. And then it started coming up. We're like, we're feeling like we're doing a better and better job with what, managing our resources. What are we doing? And that's sort of the journey as to how I came here today is to digging in what's going on, even though the, we're getting better and better and more efficient at spending the dollars we have, and we've made significant investments, what's, what's gone wrong? Why is it going up and up and up? So one thing that, when you graph it out, um, Washington actually has a very, and we'll get into this more, but there's a strong relationship between rent levels and homelessness. And if you graph it out, it's a very strong correlation. And I frankly, you know, this is the joy of data. Sometimes you're surprised. I was surprised. I thought we'd be an outlier. Washington State, this is all the states. I know it can be hard to read. This is um, percent of the people experiencing homelessness. And this is rent. Washington, you know, you, you tell Excel, draw me a trend line. Washington State's just sitting smack right on the trend line. We are just boring average when it comes to the percent of people you'd expect to be homeless given our rent levels. And this is actually, this data lags a little bit because it's census data. Um, so we can expect that as the new rent uh, data comes out and the new homeless counts come out, we'll just keep marching up this line. So when rents go up, you got, you know, you don't want to be Hawaii, right? Up here with really high rents and lots of people living outside. You got New York over here, Oregon, Nevada, and then down here you've got lower cost areas. So this is not unexpected. Now here's, this is, you know, to the extent that inflation is a normal thing, but incomes inflate, but this is rent, median rent, the red line. This is inflation adjusted, Washington State up 22%. One critique of this sort of data is that there's more luxury units these days. This is lower quartile rent, so these are the bottom 25% of rents. Those are also 
up 17%. This is middle incomes, plus 7%. This is the lowest 20% incomes, inflation adjusted. So they actually dipped below right after the Great Recession. That everyone's income actually went down. They've at least recovered, but the lowest incomes, the bottom 20% incomes, are only plus 3%, and they're facing 17% rent increases. So people who are having a hard time but were able to hold it together through you know, a series of, you know, with their rent and everything else, but we're living on the edge. As the rents go up, more and more people are getting pushed off the edge and into actual homelessness. Now, separate from homelessness, I think just affordability in general for all, for all of us, for me and you and our kids and relatives, it's, it's a critical issue. So even, even if someone's not particularly invested in homelessness, I think really digging into what's going on with this and solving it is critical. Time here. Um, so, parsing out the income a little bit, here's uh, rents again. This is not inflation adjusted, so you can see rents in just nominal terms are plus 49%. Minimum wage, when the initiative passed in Washington state, it's not that people earning minimum wage here were having a great time with affordability, but they were falling further and further behind. This is the minimum wage, is the green line, falling further and further behind. But then the minimum wage initiative passed, so at least they caught up to be in a similar worse place that they were back here. But when you look at things, fixed incomes, and this is the example I'm using is federal disability, but there's a number of fixed incomes, right? Those, if, if you're lucky, they inflate with inflation. This one inflates with inflation. So you can see disability income is plus 24%, rent plus 29%. And this is the lower quartile rent, so. So again, th these people, you know, 700 some dollars a month, which is what this represents, it gets harder and harder. So I don't need to tell you this, but Washington State is booming. We have the number one GDP growth in the United States two years in a row. The numbers came out last week. This, we, Washington State's number one in the last quarter. By all accounts, this is what a good economy looks like. We're like, a, this, is, this is what good looks like. And it's not just good, it's definitely good in the sort of macro, the larger measure of GDP growth, but so we're now up to number 10 in uh, per capita GDP. Uh, the percent of people employed, we have more people than average working. Um, earned incomes, median income is now ranked ninth, so it's not just the top, although at the top we're doing very, very well. But even in the middle, ranked number ninth. The median income growth is actually ranked second, so we have this really, this is, in terms of benchmarking against what other states look like, this is what a good job economy looks like. Now we can imagine others, but in terms of benchmarking against other states, this is what good looks like. Lowest quintile income growth is also um, growing fourth ranked. So we're actually doing better than almost all states at growing incomes at the bottom. Not that it's sufficient, but just better than other states. One critique is, oh, homelessness, people, fewer people working. So this, you know, the normal unemployment measure you know, can be flawed because there are people seeking in the last two weeks. This is just the percent of people working. You take the number of people that are over 18 and how many of them are working. And you can see this red line is the United States. This came down, this is largely demographic as baby boomers retired, uh, somewhat moved forward by the recession. And then it started coming up. So this is, well, what a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is not that, you know, potentially maybe more people could work, there could be, lots of drivers of homelessness, but what is the trend? What is the thing that changed in 2013 that started increasing homelessness? So it's different than like the long five hour conversation we could have about education, et cetera, et cetera. But this is, I'm just focusing on what is the thing that changed? So in terms of what is the thing that changed, it's not fewer people working. The trend is more and more people working. Uh, and to sort of control for the demographic changes. This is prime age employment, age 25 to 54. Again, the United States in red, Washington trending up. So more and more people of prime age working. One sort of, this is a sort of mixed look. One critique is, oh, sort of high social service states. Maybe that's disincentivizing work. If you look at Washington state, this is, um, this is age categories, I know this is a little bit hard to read, but Washington State's in green. You can see that we outperform Texas, which is a low service state by every measure, in terms of there's not a lot of social services that might disincentivize people from working. And then you look at New York, which is a high service level, in fact they have a right to housing, a right 
to shelter. And you can see actually, it's a, Washington State outperforms New York, but it's, it's not that different. So it's not, services, the level of service doesn't seem to have a lot to do with how many people are living outside. And it, here's an international comparison. I won't go through this now, but to the extent this slide is available, you can look at it. This is like the most possible people working. We've got Sweden over here, and Iceland, and New Zealand, and Japan. United States over here. Here's, here's a, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but um, this is, there's actually, uh, in terms of the argument that additional services leads to, or housing in particular, leads to people disincentivizing them to work, there's a, there's a moderate positive relationship be between providing rent assistance and a higher percentage of people working. So now there is research that shows that potentially things like Section 8 vouchers can have a two, three, four percent disincentive, but the international evidence points the other way. What's, I could, I could make some arguments as to why there's some study design here. I think it's probably about right, but it's definitely true that increasing, increasing your level of housing assistance, you can have much, much higher levels of housing assistance and have higher levels of employment than we have here as based on international experience. And this is the classic, uh, you know, if, I won't get into that in terms of time. But uh, disability, Washington State, this is the percentage of people on federal disability. Washington State's down here. Here's the United States. So we have low, if the number of people on disability was a driver of homelessness, we should have less than average, but we have, I mean, we should have, the United States has more than average, anyway. King County's down here, Snohomish County, Thurston, I added last night, They're right here, below, even below even the Washington average. Families, one thing you hear sometimes is, and you know, there was some evidence for this in the past, but in terms of recent trends, again, what is the thing that changed starting in 2013 that led to more people living outside? Um, family stability is increasing. Uh, Washington families are above average. I mean, I could, there's a whole, again, in terms of time, I might won't go, I have only like 10 slides on this, but I'll only show you a few. But divorce, domestic violence, teenage pregnancy declining, the percentage of children in married coupled households is increasing in Washington state. And in fact, Washington state is now ranked number five in terms of the percentage of kids who are living in a married couple household. And then just marriage in general in Washington, going gangbusters, and we're now ranked number eight. Lots of marriage, lots of, lots of functional together families. Here's the trend again. The trend, we're number five, the trend is increasing, not, doesn't seem, family breakdown does not seem to be a driver. That is not, this is trending in a positive direction and Washington is a high performer. Boy, drugs, um, that's a complicated, long conversation. Here's the quick version. Uh, so you see this slide in the news media, opiate crisis, it's a real thing. This is, this is the standard measurement. This is deaths going up and up and up. When you look at Washington, and I won't go through all the details here, but you can look at all the citations. Washington's trend is actually pretty flat. That's not to say there's not a lot of people with significant opiate addictions, and it's a crisis, and it came up before the homelessness started coming up. But it's not a recent trend that's increasing. Here's another way of looking at it. And for people who've seen this slide presentation before, this is a new slide, so you can be patient at this point. Um, so this is that, again, US, this is the US drug overdose rate, which is the one you see in the media about the drug crisis. It's going up and up and up. This is homelessness in the United States, going down and down and down. So they're negatively, if you're negatively correlated, you look at Washington, we've had a much more gradual, slow increase in our drug problem. Again, we have a real problem, but compared to the US, High performer, Washington State's a high performer. But this is our homelessness rate, it's going up. So if you would expect, yeah. If it was correlated, you would expect these to go up together, but they're not. So really the point of today's uh, presentation, to, you know, to sort of get off that tangent of homelessness, which is really, again, that's my day job. But, um, if you can remember one thing from this presentation, it's that since 2005 in Washington, there's different baseline years you can use, but however, any way you measure it, you get similar results. Population has increased 19%, percent 
Housing units have increased 14%. This is from 2006 to 2016. If we had been building this right number of units to keep the similar ratio of people to units, we would have built in Washington State up to the top of this bar. What we actually built was to the, the blue part. So the deficit, the growing deficit, is at this point through 2016, 118,000 units. In a good year, Washington State, about 40,000 units get built, um, mostly private markets, some public. We're years behind, years behind. Here's Thurston County data. Now some of the, you know, there's the census data, so sometimes there's the error bars that might explain some of the wonkiness here, but I think this is probably just about right. So, although you all are a little closer to, the, to it than I am, there's actually, uh, there was a deficit here starting in 2006, but then there was actually a little bit of oversupply during the Great Recession, not oversupply, maybe catching up, because this is your rental vacancy rate, and you want it six or seven percent, so it actually got to a healthy level in 2011 there, but then, you, then there started to be an underbuild again, and then the rental vacancy rate came down to a really unhealthy, too tight level of three percent. So that's Thurston County. One thing, well, Seattle, King County, crane capital of the world. Lots of building going. And it was like, there's all this building going on. We must just be building. Maybe we're overbuilding, right? When you look at the data, and when you look at the ratio of housing permits to population increases, this is dating back to 1993. We are building below average the number of housing units per person than we do just in an average year. You'd never know. Does this look like we're the number one economy in the nation and arguably in the world? This looks like a lot of underbuilding. And this is through June, so it's not like, oh, it's catching up. In fact, it's falling further and further behind. And so, you know, when I put that first slide into these presentations, I didn't say it, but kind of in the back of my head, well, maybe it's the growth management boundary or something, you know? Maybe, maybe we're just doing it all wrong here in Washington. But then the deeper I dug into it after more back and forth in sessions like this, this is all the large metropolitan areas that grew more than 10% in the United States from 2005 to 2016. And if you're below this line, that means you're not building as many units as people moving in. So you can see that not only Seattle King County is underbuilding, but you've got places that don't even have zoning, right? <laughs> Just like the, the libertarian paradise, quote unquote, right? Houston, right? Underbuilding. So we're seeing underbuilding all across the nation. And in the interest of time, I won't go into that's a whole nother to like what's going on nationally. It's not just us, if that's any consolation. It's not just Washington, it's not just Olympia. This is a problem across the country. Atlanta's the outlier. Still haven't 100% figured out what's going on in Atlanta where they actually build more houses and people moving in. The worst here is Denver. Keep that in mind for the next slide. Denver, San Francisco, then Seattle, then Miami-Dade, et cetera. So this, I haven't figured out how to explain this chart. It, it's a very strong correlation. It's a 0.69 or something like that. But housing unit growth closer to population growth e equals smaller rent increases. So these are the rent increases for lower quintile units in different communities. And, um, and yeah, this is the growth in in housing, this is the difference between the growth. So anyway, it's a, there's a strong correlation between keeping closer, building closer to the number of units needed and having, not having your rents grow. And um, I didn't go through the slide, but there, you know, there's a slide that has to do with, to the extent that rents go up, it's been replicated in three different studies now, there's a strong correlation as rents go up, homelessness increases. And the reason that rent's growing up is tightening supply, and I'm showing the you know, rental vacancy rate, Washington State, it's thought to be, and you can argue about what the exact number is, is this, this particular study said that the balanced rate or the natural rate, the vacancy rate you want so that prices don't accelerate and simultaneously, but you don't want a vacancy rates too high, right, because then people don't invest and units become undercapitalized. So the balance rate is about 7%. Washington State started somewhere close to a balanced rate in 2010. Now we're down to 3.2. The worst is actually Clallam County. Again, not anywhere, not, there's no Amazon in Clallam County. Uh, you've got Whatcom County at 
there's a you know a bit of an error bar here, so it could be plus or minus a bit here, but Thurston, this particular data set shows 4.7. I think the more reliable data shows lower than that, um, for sure. I used that in the previous slide. And again, I won't walk out with you on the different data sources, but I was using census data because it's consistent uh, in this case. And then, uh, you know, you should always be skeptical of Economics 101, but this is a fun Economics 101 slide that I think is actually true. Uh, the red line, as your, or as your vacancy rate goes up, your annual rent increases go down, and as your vacancy rate comes down, 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 past the balanced rate, your annual rent increases go up, up, up. So supply, supply, supply. Not only is it pushing people into homelessness, it's, pe it's squishing people in the middle in the terms of their ability to afford day-to-day -day things. And then I'll just skip the rest of these slides in the name of time and we'll leave it there and there'll be questions later. Thank you. I killed one mic. Well, thank you, Ted. Uh, very, very much appreciate the information. Um, I would say some of it is pretty startling in my eyes. Some of it is very common sense, but it really paints a, uh, a picture. Uh, with that picture in your mind, uh, it's a pleasure now to introduce uh, our next presenter, uh, Zach Kostrovs. Zach is president and owner of Prime Locations, a full service commercial real estate company. He is actively engaged in the Thurston Thrives Housing Action Team and has been instrumental in the development of the Thurston Thrives Housing Performa that you will hear more about shortly. So with that, Zach. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much for being here and uh, thanks for your presentation. That was, that was really good and I think confirming of a lot of what we've, many of us in this room have discussed over the last year, two years. Uh, I got involved in the housing action team almost two years ago. And basically, we sat down and said, how can, how can people from all walks of life and all sides of the real estate aisle come together and try and figure out how to fix some of the problems that we're talking about here tonight? And so we have nonprofit, public sector, private sector. Uh, we have some elected, some uh, just people from everywhere in, in our community. And I think that's really what it takes. And so what we did was we said, for Thurston County, that was a lot of great information on sort of a macro level from the state and national uh, level. But what do we do here, boots on the ground in Thurston County? And what does the problem look like here? And so some of the data that I'm going to share is a little bit different, but it's pretty much uh, similar. So my data sources uh, really came from some of the census data, some of the TRPC data, but also data that I got directly from our local municipalities as it relates to uh, housing starts, units being built, units being permitted. And so I think the general, uh, the general theme is the same, but the data is a little bit different. So when we look at Thurston County and we want to quant quantify the problem here, what does it look like? And in our data, what we found is going forward with population growth, if we just continue on the curve that we currently have, we need about 2,000 units a year to be built. Over the last six years, on average, we've been short by about 600 units per year. And so when you think about right now, there's roughly, let's say, 120,000 housing units in Thurston County. Um, we need 2,000 a year. We're short 600. And so it doesn't sound like a huge number, but when you think about it, that's about a, th a third, essentially, of the units we need to build every year that we're not currently building. <laughs> The other thing that we found in our research was 60 years ago, the average household had about three people in it. Today, if you look in, inside the, the, the cities themselves, it, like in the city of Olympia, averages 2.2 people per household. So as household sizes get smaller, for, to meet this, the demand for the number of people, we need more housing units. And as, as we heard earlier, as we have uh, lower vacancy rates, it leads to increased costs. And as you were talking about that, I thought about it. In, if we have 120,000 units in Thurston County, let's say uh, roughly 35,000 of those currently are apartment units. Well, if, if the vacancy rate is 3%, that's not very many units that are available to rent. Now think through this. If 
Half of those are in the process of being turned to be re-rented. The inventory actually available on the market is even less than that. And then and we know in our business that about 40 to 50% of those units every year might turn over. And so the reason that you see those prices really going up is because if that many renters of apartment units specifically are turning over every year, and there's that few units on the market available, what, is, what happens to pricing? It goes up. So while the vacancy rate looks like it's maybe 3.5 or 3.7, the, the reality of it is what's available to actually rent when you go on Craigslist or you go wherever you're gonna go to look on Andrew's website is about half of that number. And so that's also what's playing into the, to the increase in cost. And obviously like we, we saw earlier, too much demand and not enough supply, as we learned in Economics 101, means prices continue to go up. Uh, the challenge when we look at, okay, well why don't we bring enough supply online? Well, one of the main challenges is that, especially when we talk about affordable housing, is that when we bring on new supply, it's expensive to build. And so as it's expensive to build, it means that less units get built for the lower income demographic of the market. And as I get further on into this, I'll explain why. Because I think, I think there's just a little confusion around how that works, and I think uh, we'll show you here today how that, how that goes. So what does it do for our communities? It leads to wealth destruction. Right now in Thurston County, we have over 30% of our residents, our households are spending more than 30% of their income on housing. 15% are spending more than half of their income on housing. And so as that happens, we end up with, as we've heard, more people who become homeless, more people who become what we call cost burden. And I think part of the reason that we have so many different people at the table today, so many people in this room today, is because I think we can all agree that long term, that's not, that doesn't do very much to create a healthy, vibrant community. And so if we're gonna fix that, we've gotta start thinking outside the box. Public and nonprofits, they do the best they can to build enough units to meet those folks' needs. Uh, but here's something to think about. If we need 2,000 2, units a year, if you just look at the income data, if you wanna serve people at 80% of median income and below, about 600 of those units need to serve those people. Last year was the biggest year we've had in a decade with public and nonprofit construction, and we had about, it was either 321 or 351 units. On average, it's been around 100 to 150. So if we need to get to 600, we need to figure out a way, I think, to get the private sector involved in that conversation. So what's really going on? Why aren't more of these units being built? Why aren't specifically more affordable units being built? And I think there's a simple explanation. So I think of it as ha new housing development five steps. And here's the thing. This is sort of as a developer what, what the mindset is. There's five steps that a developer has to go through. They have to vet these five steps. If any one of these doesn't work out, we don't get new units. But if all five work out, we get new units. And the first is, what's the development cost? What's it, what, are, what are we actually going to spend to bring this thing out of the ground and get it done? Then we have to look at what's the income we're gonna generate off of that. If we're building apartments, what are the rents? What are the laundry fees and the pet fees? And what's all the income we're gonna generate? And then how much are the expenses gonna be? What are the property taxes? What's the payroll? What, what does it cost to operate this thing? And then what's that mean for our return? And then is it worth the risk? Right, so if, it, if all those check out and it's worth the risk, we get new housing units, but if it doesn't, then we don't get new housing units and we end up 600 units a year under supply. And so, so the model is what I'm gonna kinda of walk through here. What we did is we, we stepped back and we said, maybe it would be really easier to explain this if we could show it visually. Because what you hear on the news, just like you were referencing a lot of things we hear on the news that maybe don't really lead up to reality. A lot of what we hear on the news right now today is a lot of developers maybe are greedy or they're this or they're that, and so that can be the perception. But when, when we look at it in reality, we said if we could build a model where we could show, if we just built a market rate product, market rate apartment complex, what's a developer make? Now if we wanted to make, let's say, 35% of the units in the same complex affordable, what does the developer make? And then will they do it? Is it enough to do it? And so that's the model. So when we start, we start with the development costs. We've got to deal with the land acquisition, developing the land. We've got the hard construction cost. Uh, we've got soft costs. We've got uh, mitigation fees, impact fees, other fees. We've got taxes. And then debt financing and equity costs. And the larger the projects get, 
the more involved the debt financing and the, and the equity costs become. So over here, here's just an example. A 65 unit apartment complex, just as an example. If you spend a million dollars on the land and it costs you six million to build it with your construction and your soft costs and fees and taxes were four, and these, these will change depending on where you're doing it, and your debt financing and equity is a million, your total cost is $12 million. If you had to put $3 million down, which today it would be more than that, but let's say you had to bring $3 million of your own money, your mortgage payment would be $45,000 a month. That's what it would cost for you to actually pay the mortgage on that property. Now, how much would that thing bring in for you? You've got your rent, you've got your utility reimbursements, other reimbursements, your, your fees, like your pet fees, your admin fees, some of these other fees, and then you've got, you've got to back out your vacancy and delinquency. So if your gross rent potential, that's what we call it, if, you're, if the most rent you could get, if all the units were full all the time, every day, it would be about a million, one, $1.1 million. If you had about a 5% vacancy, that's 55,000. Uh, 1% delinquency, another 10. Some other income, 165,000. Your gross income's at $1.2 million. And that might sound like a lot until we get to the next few slides. So now we've got to do our payroll. We've got to pay the folks that work there. We've got to pay the property manager. We've got to pay the administrative costs. We've got utilities to cover. We've got repairs, maintenance, and reserves. We've got taxes and insurance. So here we've, here's, our, here's our expense budget. Our total expenses are about 490000 So now we've got to figure out, well, for the developer, is it worth it? We've got our income, our expenses. We already knew the mortgage payment was about $45,000 a month, if you recall. Here's what it looks like. You got your income minus your expenses gets to what we call net operating income minus your mortgage payment. So on your $3 million, you made $170,000 that year. Mind you, that didn't even include reserves, which any, if you ask Ken in the room, he'd tell you he'd want to see a reserve number in there. You made 5.7% on your cash in terms of cash you made, cash you put in at a 5.5% cap rate, which we don't have to get in here, but the way the market would value it today's market, it'd be worth 12.9 million. That's before selling costs. So if you figure, let's say six, seven, eight percent cost to sell, you would build this project, you'd make a reasonably low return and you wouldn't have a whole lot of equity left in the deal. Now this is a market rate project. Mind you, this is with rents that uh, today, market rate rents, if you look at some of the building, the, the newer garden style units being built, a one bedroom, one bath is $1,300 a month. You know, a three bedroom, two bath is, 1950 to 2200. When you look at how affordable is that for a lot of people in this community, it's not affordable, right? But, but if you see, if the cost goes up and the mortgage payment goes up, the return goes down and we get under supply because cost is driven by cost. And I think that's one of the misconceptions. So we looked at it and we said, okay, well, uh, well, let's get into risk actually. So when we look at that, in that market rate example even, the developer goes, well, is the risk worth it? Somebody's got to personally guarantee a really big loan. Uh, they got to put their life on the line for that. What could go wrong? Today, these developments might look really good. But as uh, if, you're, if you've ever developed something, what you know is that you might start it today and you might not actually get through construction and lease up for three years. Well, you go to refinance your loan, because in big loans, you, you don't get to just roll into a permanent loan. What if your interest rate goes up 2%? Right? All these things that could happen where you might not make any money at all. The other thing which I think is really important when we have these discussions is, if we make housing not very attractive to build, if we make that service not very attractive to provide, there's other options for people to put their money in. If you have to choose between an S&P 500 index fund making you 10% a year and doing nothing, or investing in real estate, uh, you gotta be able to make money in real estate or you end up picking the S&P 500 index fund. So here's just some risk factors. We don't have to go through all those, but there are things that, that developers have to take into consideration. So now we look at affordability. And I think what I said earlier, I'll re reiterate, the price inflation in terms of construction costs, if the project's gonna get built, will ultimately get passed on to the renter. It just has to or else we can't build the project. If revenue de decreases, that means the returns are decreased and then we don't get projects financed and the reward just isn't worth the risk. So we look at this, we say, okay, same scenario, 65 units, market rate cost to build, but now let's say we want 35% of those units to be affordable. 
And when I say affordable, I'm talking, uh, to give you an example in my model that we've, dis that we've created, the $1,300 one bedroom, one bath unit that was market rate, the average rent, because we can delineate it by income demographic, is about $600. So that's how much more affordable those units are. Everything else stays the same to build it. You still have the same property taxes, the same payroll, the same construction costs, the same impact fees, but now your, your income's less, right? Because your rents are lower. Well now, the developer, he's actually losing money. He's, losing, he's got a negative annual return, and he lost you know, almost $3 million if he were to sell it. And so this is why we don't get more affordable units, because unless we change this part of the, the structure, no private developer will build it. And not only private developers, this model, if you were to ask some of the public and nonprofit developers in the room, really limits their ability to build more units because they're running into all the same cost burdens. So then we said, well, what are the potential solutions? And we came up, we came up with like 15, right? But then we said, well, that's not very digestible. If there were three things that we could wave a magic wand and do, what would they be? And these were the th three things we came up with. The first thing is if we can just speed up the process and we can make more land available to build higher density, that's gonna go a long way to at least creating the ability to provide more supply. Second thing is if we can mitigate some of the, the permit fees, the impact fees, some of these fees, uh, I was talking to a developer, a very large developer yesterday, and he literally told me, I'm gonna do this project in Seattle as opposed to Thurston County because the fees on the project in Thurston County were more than they were in Seattle. And so I think we have to look at some of those structures. The next one is tax flexibility. So Walla Walla is trying to pilot a program right now uh, that Mr. Barkas knows more about than me, but essentially it's a sales tax credit on construction costs that would go in to paying for some of these other things we've talked about, ultimately lowering the cost to the developer. But we're also looking at the multifamily property tax exemption. Uh, we, we, I think the city of Olympia is looking at expanding their borders. I know all three cities uh, have areas where that multifamily property tax exemption exists, but the more we can expand that, I think the more incentive developers will have to do some of these projects. So here's what we came up with, and here's what the model really does, is I've given you the two scenarios, and I said, well, what if there was a third scenario? What if there was a scenario where the developer could build the project with 65 units, could have 35% of the units be affordable, and could still make a, a profit? <laughs> What would, it, what would we have to do to get there? And so this is where the model comes in. In this example, we mitigated some of the impact fees. Now, we didn't get rid of any of them. We just reduced some of them. We reduced taxes, so we, we looked at the multifamily property tax exemption. We sped up the process by about four months. And all of our incentives, and this is an important point, they're all tied to affordability. We're not saying that every municipality should just come in and just you know, roll out the red carpet and just give things away. What they're saying, what we're saying is if a developer is willing to come in and build affordable units, but they need an incentive to help them make it doable, we should, we should look at ways to make that possible. Because here's what this example looks like. We still have that million dollars of income because our rents are still affordable. Our expenses went down because now we're not paying this property tax every year, not all of it at least. Our net income went back up. Our mortgage payment went down because the cost of construction went down. So what they're financing was less, so they had more money left over, less debt service. So their cash flow was actually higher than in the market rate project. Their cash on cash return was higher, and their project was actually worth, they actually had more equity in the project here than they did in the straight mar market rate project. And so this is what we can do if we can figure out ways to get through some of those other things. And so that's really what the model is a tool that, that the municipalities have, where they can look at projects on a project specific basis, or they can look at some of the planning they're doing in the future to, to really weigh, and I think this is an important part of the conversation. If housing is the priority, we have to make it the priority. Because there's a lot of talk about housing being the priority, and we have to actually make it the priority. And so there will be things that we all have to sacrifice on, that we all have to take a risk on. But I think when we look at some of this information, we look at the, the growing homeless population, we look at the vacancy rates not going up. Seattle, two months ago in the Seattle Times, wrote the first, first article, rents in Seattle finally go down, $50 a month. 
And you read the article, and what did they do? They finally had more units coming online for that little short blip of time than their population growth uh, could sustain. And so we, we think that this is a tool that we can use. I th we think that these forums are, are places we can come together and brainstorm and, and talk through how can we utilize this so we don't continue to undersupply the market with housing. And so moving forward, obviously the th what we're doing right now isn't working. And so we've got to think outside the box. We have to be innovative. It's a big problem. It's very complicated. Uh, there's a lot of fingers in, in, in everything we do. But we've got to be able to come to the table, sit together, and come up with solutions by working together. And again, we have, we've created the housing affordability model. Um, most of the municipalities that I know of in the room have, have at least seen it or be, been introduced to it. But we would encourage you to use it. Uh, we're going to continue to keep doing the work we've been doing. We're going to continue to work with uh, the state, and we'll probably start working, hopefully at some point, with uh, some of the, the federal folks, also some of the lenders. So we think there are things we can be doing to continue this work, and uh, we look forward to partnering with you all to make this become a reality. So thank you for that. If you have more questions, uh, you can email housingthurston at co.thurston.wa.us. We do have somebody who will uh, forward that email to somebody who can answer the question, but I think the plan tonight is to continue the conversation. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Zach. Well, we're going to take a, uh, a few minute break. Uh, we'll, we'll shoot for a 10 minute break. So when you uh, hear the chatter on the mic, if you could get back to your uh, tables, that would be great. And then we'll have one more session of information sharing with the panel discussion, and then we'll move into the roundtable conversations. So have a break. <laughs> Let's just jump right in. Uh, for anyone who wants to field it first. In your opinion, what is the number one thing that needs to occur or be addressed in our community around housing? I'll answer that because I think the other two gentlemen have already given you that answer in their presentations. Supply. We need more supply to meet the ever-growing demand of the households that keep getting smaller, but we still need more properties, so demand, supply. I guess that was kind of the no duh question. Uh, <laughs> Trudy, let's keep let's keep you with the mic. We will get we'll get there, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you for that suggestion, though. Uh, as a nonprofit, uh, what is the benefit to bringing the private sector into affordable housing conversation? Uh, uh, you said, please jump right in. I know you have really strong thoughts on this. Oh, I always have strong thoughts on everything, right? Everybody knows me. Um, so I think. Um, Nonprofits and the public sector are always better when they have more partners at the table. So often we get stuck in a cycle of this is how we've always done things, the nonprofit world and the public world. And so when we bring in the private market and start asking them the questions about what we've done here with the incentivized housing, why aren't you able to do what we want you to do? And how do we get you to the table to make changes? So I think that's as a nonprofit and one of the nonprofit representatives on the housing action team and on the incentivized housing team, we need the private market to be good partners at the table with us so that we can make the supply that needs to happen. Excellent. All right. So one of the uh, things I forgot to mention in the, in the introduction of the panel section, if you have a thought or a question that you want to throw out there, uh, it's your turn. So, Commissioner, you, you had a quick comment. Is there anything you want to follow up with? You talked about uh, supply demand and a little bit more in depth on the conversation. Uh, no, because uh, you mentioned, Trudy, that the uh, supply, of course, is, but how do we get more supply? And that's where you're going to end up uh, more municipalities and governmental factions, fed, state, county, city need to get involved to open up that, uh, that pipe and get the clogs out to get the services flowing to the builders. Uh, the incentivization that we were talking about, taxes, uh, uh, whatever, the fees, all the, all the whatnot. So there's got to be a way to incentivize the, the supply or the, the suppliers to get the supply there. I thought we were going to go deeper with that. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I keep looking at Zach because we have these conversations all the time. And what I think this is why we formed the Incentivized Housing Task Force was to answer that question exactly. How do we open up the pipeline? How do we get more people at the table? And that's where we came up with these, which was originally the 15 things. And we came down to the three. Right? And that's what Zach's presentation was on. But we need to have the private market developers at the table having a transparent conversation with the cities and the jurisdictions who have the land that is potentially there to be built on. So once we can get those two groups together at the table and we have some nonprofits who come to the table and say, and here's what we can bring to the mix, then you can work through what are the barriers and how do we come, overcome them. Can I add something? Uh, and, and I think just real simplistically from the private sector standpoint, it's if we can make it easier for a private sector developer to build a unit and make a profit, they'll come to build more units. So I think when we look at um, when we look at the timeline and how long it takes to go from the conception of a project to the completion of a project, if we can expedite that process, it helps. If we can reduce costs so that they can uh, be more, because because so much of developing is just underwriting the risk that you're going to incur over a four-year window that you can't really predict. And so the, the the faster we can make that process, the less inherent risk there is of the unknown. And then if we can reduce the cost, right, it makes it even easier for a developer to come in and say, okay, great. Uh, I was telling somebody in our little break, I had a conversation yesterday morning with this, somebody who, who looked at a 238 unit development in Thurston County that we were talking to. And the only reason they're even here, so, so we look at the affordable problem as a problem, because it is. But the outside developers, these guys were huge developers from out of this area, are coming to Thurston County because we finally have rents high enough for them to say, well, maybe we can, maybe we, it's worth coming and looking at. And so we just have to be able to balance, you know, how do we get there? How do we make it incentive, how do we incentivize enough for them to actually show up, uh, but also do it in a way where we still create some units that are affordable? So Ted, this might be one for you. Uh, actually, it's for all the panelists, but uh, you did a really nice job of, of looking for causal effects of homelessness, and definitely uh, supply was was there. Uh, in, in your collective wisdom uh, of the three of you, how would uh, the increasing of uh, private sector uh, role in, in housing, how, how would that uh, impact what you believe is the, the supply demand dilemma? Well, I think, what, you know, so at some level we're talking, just bringing down, I just want to emphasize, supply of any kind is going to help. Just anything, even I mean, without getting to a long discussion of filtering and all that sort of theoretical stuff, building luxury units is going to help because it's just going to generally free things up. So I think that's critical, and to the extent that you can fix the price problem for middle income people, it's gonna cascade down the chain. That said, I mean, it's very clear, the math is very clear that people in the bottom, at, you know, 20, 30%, you're gonna need a subsidy for that to be affordable. So the question is, if, if you've got the price at the middle market rate lower, you're gonna need less of a subsidy. So it's either, if you wanna, if you wanna address the peop, uh, affordability of low income people and homelessness, you can invest tens of millions of dollars and more, uh, big, big numbers in subsidies, or you can bring down the middle price. You're always gonna have to make an investment at the bottom end. Um, but I, I guess that's one of the things that, one of the messages, and why I'm sort of, my day job really isn't this, but just what I'm sort of passionate about it is that I have, you know, policymakers come to me and say, hey, how about we make this investment? I'm like, that would be great. That's going to help people, real people in the real world. But you were just going to be overwhelmed by the, by the tsunami of market forces that are going to drive more people into homelessness and make every dollar of subsidy you give me go you know, not as far as it did the day before. So really, in the volume, when you just do the math about what the level of mar market rate supply versus anything you could ever conceive of as publicly subsidized, you've got to figure out how to fix the middle in order to make real progress at the bottom. 
Homes First is that they're uh, looking to purchase houses right now. We're getting some public funds in the fall, and we're working with Only Fed, who's helping us with mortgages. And what we're seeing in pro properties that are already occupied are, generally, we like to buy unoccupied houses. There's fewer of those. So we go in and look at a property that we think should be a low-income house. It's older. It's in a neighborhood that's older. And generally, those are the places where you have low-income families living. Well, actually, that's where middle-income families are living now because the rents are getting too high, to tack onto what you were saying, for the middle-income folks to afford middle-income housing. And so now they're living in what would traditionally be low-income housing. So then, where do those low-income people go? Well, they end up on the street or living in a tent or living in their car because there's nowhere else for them to go. Or paying 50% of their income just to have a place to live. One of the scenarios that I've been thrown out there recently is if, if let's say next year we permitted in Thurston County 1,200 apartment units, we, if we could figure out a way to get the private sector to take 15% of those and make them affordable units, we essentially double the annual average of what the public, public and nonprofits are bringing online for affordable housing just by doing that. And so, so my, one of the things I think about is if we can do that, it hopefully will free up some of the public sector money to be, to be instead of invested in, let's say, that middle section, back into that lower section that the private sector has a really hard time solving the problem for. Right? So if, if the public sector doesn't have to spend so much money helping to, to alleviate the price burden on, on that sort of middle tier of, of median income, and they can focus more of their dollars on that bottom tier of median income. I think the public sector dollars sure go a lot further, and I don't think it's I don't think it's that much of a stretch to figure out how to get there. Thank you, audience. Oh, here we go. All right, Crosby, could you run the mic? Uh, David, the, the question that I have for the panel would be, I hear all the time, we've got all this new construction going on in downtown Olympia, and it's driving up the cost of housing, and I know you've already responded to this in some fashion already, but I'd just like to hear it one more time, <laughs> that new construction, at least my perception of it, doesn't drive up the cost of housing. Is that true? Yeah, I think it's, it's like, like we said, any supply is good supply, but I think it's deeper than that. When you look at what actually drives the cost of most rental units, uh, you got to think about the average, the average person that's renting a property. Many of them are deciding between, can I buy a property or can I rent a property? And as, a, as the barrier to buying a house, the barrier to that entry gets higher, more of those people end up renting units. Well, as the price of housing goes up, that means the cost of the mortgage goes up. That means the rental market can absorb higher rates, right? Because the minute that rental rates are more expensive than mortgage mortgages, it means more people will try and buy houses. Well, guess what? I think, I, think, uh, I don't know if it was you or somebody else, but when, when we used to look at the numbers, uh, we did a demand study for Thurston County uh, two months ago. They said Thurston County, similar to our data, needed about 2,000 units a year. This is where they were wrong. They said, we think Thurston County needs 26% of those units to be multifamily because that's historical. I said, well, look at the data. Olympia last, or this year, I think, permitted about 220 or 280 apartments and 21 or 25 single-family homes. It's flip-flopped. And why is it flip-flopped? Well, there's, there's reasons for that, but, but the point being is that the more supply, like in 2008, I say this all the time, the market crashed because to a large degree we got oversupplied. Well, what happened to the price of all housing? Got cut in half, got cut by a third, because that's what oversupply does. Now, what we have to figure out is how to not do that again, but how to, to, how to e have equilibrium in our supply and demand. So, I, no, in, new units don't drive up the price of, of the, the current units. What, what does is not building enough units. So when we're only building 20 or 25 single family homes out of three or 400 units, that's driving up the price more than building nice fancy apartments in downtown Olympia. Does that make sense? Add to what 
what Zach was just saying. Um, it's all about density, and our growth management act is driving us to density. And we can afford a lot more units if we do denser units. One of the challenges, and that's why we see it flip flop in terms of apartments versus single family. Single family is very, very expensive in Christian County. And so it's multifamily, but we can actually deliver more units for less dollars. Um, one of the challenges is we can only do that in the rental market because of our state laws relative to the Condominium Act. The pendulum has swung so far in the last 10, 15 years that um, very few people are willing to take that risk. We have one gentleman in the room that is trying, but he's one, uh, delivering, uh, how many units, 30? 28, 28 units. We should see hundreds of condominiums being built in Thurston County. It is a terrific alternative uh, to single family homes and our Growth Management Act is pushing this. So you have one state policy that is pushing against another state policy. And if there were any representatives of state organizations in here, I would appreciate them circling back to say, you are actually the biggest problem right now. <laughs> That's a fact. And so we have, <laughs> we have got to get that changed because many of our insurers, so as an, as an architect, many of our insurance companies, they don't even want to insure us on condominium projects. And if they do, it's incredibly expensive. So anyhow, so that, that's my, uh, my two cents. <laughs> and direct to the point, please. Hey, well, thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, actually, we are working on condo liability. And last year, we had a piece of legislation, because I've been fully aware of that as one of the drivers. Um, we had a piece of legislation that was proposed. It got very close. It came out of committee. It was on the floor. didn't get to the floor for a final vote. Uh, there was another piece that came up. The trial lawyers got involved. And that was that. It is very high on the agenda for both realtors and the building association. And actually, I was having a conversation around today. So there will be legislation coming forth for kind of liability reform this year. So uh, it's very good. I want to add one thing since I'm my thank you. Um, I appreciate everything that's been said. And we are working very closely state locally on so many different of these aspects. And I want to commend Bud and others in this room that have been around those tables. Um, Zach brought up a good point, and I was looking around to try to see if, if we had some educators here uh, from our community college. We have, we're in one of a phenomenal facility. Uh, labor is uh, one of the other drivers. We've been talking a lot about uh, costs and fees and everything else, but um, Zach made a great point that you know after the recession, everybody left the trades, it left the industry, and we have had this incredible, one of my friends who's sitting back here, I asked uh, how much you're leaving on the table that you can't do because labor and it's the dollars are staggering because we just don't have the labor so it's another piece of the conversation that we have to keep pushing the career technical education path and rebuilding our labor pool in the trades because in order to build that we have to have people to build it okay we're in, we have we have time for one more question so your call Crosby and who I'm gaining out of this one your call Kelsey There are plants in the audience, uh, that's fine. Um, so acknowledging the political and the media climate that we're in and that um, we do commonly see builders and developers sort of demonized in that environment, do you have any thoughts on um, what it might take to build community and political will around some of these changes, which we have to acknowledge will be a heavy lift, how we might do that and how people in the room might be able to support um, that happening? I'm gonna start answering this question, then I'll hand it off to Zach. But as we've been out in the community for the last two years developing this idea of incentivizing developers to come to the table, we are seeing over and over again that there are developers who live in our community, who are a part of our community, and who want to make it better for everyone, right? And so I think that there are opportunities out there because there are people who care. If they care, because they're a developer, doesn't mean they're bad. Right? It's just the job that they've chosen to do that they're really good at. And so we need to invite them to the table as a partner, as a community member, and then ask the questions to get to the reason why they're not doing it. Right? So I think we know there's developers, we know there's investors out there in our community who want to invest in affordable housing. They're just looking for the opportunity to do it. People who care about having more homes in our community for more people. 
Oh, I just, um, you know, one of the things I think, you know, related to this, it's builders, and it's sort of an extension of this builder built this thing, they made money, and they changed the character of my neighborhood. And I get the character, the, the strong allegiance to the character of the neighborhood, to the, you know, the way my neighborhood is the day I bought it, I don't really want to change. Just in general, human psychology, people don't like change. I think one of the things that's underappreciated and maybe could contribute to it is educating people, and maybe this is like false hope, but to the extent that people understand Character, like keeping the character of my neighborhood, not have experiencing change, that has a value. But there is a price to pay for that. And if people aren't understanding the price, in that, um, now I mean, unfortunately, part of the price is that there's they experience lots of price appreciation. So it's actually good for them. But to to the extent that other people in their community, their children, people now living outside, and the and the fallout, not to mention for the people living outside, but just generally from that, there's a real cost. At at fighting change at any cost and, um, and by extension, you know, demonizing developers who are really, you know, as for the math, you know, everyone's human. But at the end of the day, it's basically math. People are responding to incentives. It's a system. And it's where we set the equilibrium points. And, you know, let's, let's set the equilibrium point at a place where the market can supply without government subsidy affordable housing for a median income family. Yeah, and I think part of it is changing. I mean, we call them developers, we call them builders, but really these folks are providing a very, very valuable community service. Like, w if we don't have people building housing units, that's a service we need in our community. And when we villainize people doing it, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate because if they stop doing it, we sit in this room with a much greater problem than we already have. But the other thing in my personal involvement was uh, Mike Reed's in the room, and he's heard me say for at least nine years, that I've always wanted to sit at a table like this with my spreadsheet and have a real conversation because to me, uh, uh, it's, it's not about convincing anyone of anything. It's about educating somebody about what we're dealing with and then having them educate me about what they're dealing with so that we can be compelled together to create a solution. And I think these conversations too often end up where it's somebody trying to convince somebody of something else and then they get into an argument as opposed to I don't know everything that a municipality has to deal with with regard to hookup fees and impact fees, so let's talk about that. At the same time, let me show you my spreadsheet so that I can show you how we make these decisions about what we build and what we don't build. And then let's figure out a way if we can put our heads together and solve the problem. And so for me, I think a lot of it's not just educating people in this room, it's educating our, our community members outside. That it's not just a matter of a developer saying, I wanna make $3 million this year. It's about a developer saying, this is the process I go through to, to, to decide if I can do this or not. And I think just education, when we look at how policy changes and how culture changes, so much of it is dri driven by how do we educate? How do we frame the message? And I think so much of what I think is awesome about everybody in this room here today is we get to, we get to choose, on, choose how we frame that message moving forward. And I think that's how we need to frame it. Let's thank our panelists. All right, now it's all your turn. We have conversations amongst yourselves. We have uh, individual staff in each table. The, the tables, if you're wondering, how did I end up sitting here? We tried to balance the table out with an eclectic group of individuals for each table that come from different perspectives and uh, either elected officials or staff people. So it sounds like you're at it, so staff take over. All right, who, who would like to uh, start out with a, a minute of uh, thoughts and conversations uh, that occurred at their table? You got a minute. Crosby? Oh. oh. All right, Todd. All right, I guess I got no. Is this on? Test. Uh, just a couple things real quick. Everybody at our table agreed that it should be a partnership of the public, nonprofit, and private. Partnership. Bring everybody to the table, uh, provide incentives for everybody to get to the table, and provide incentives to solve it. Yeah. And um, if it's a crisis, if it really is, if that's the right word, act like it. I don't think we've been acting like it. And we talked a little bit about the table. We're not acting, if it's really a crisis, something's burning down, you put all your resources at it, you come together and solve it. And we've been kind of talking about this for a long time. And why are we surprised? This, it's a, it's a, a 
it's our policies that have led to this, as, as uh, some of the data uh, kind of sorted out. And then uh, we should also, when we're making public policy, consider the unintended consequences of really good public policy. Each individual one sometimes seems like the best thing. Oh, we need fire sprinklers. We'll save a life every 10 years in our single family homes. But every time we push somebody into homelessness, they die at 25 years sooner than what you or I are gonna die at. So we're actually perhaps killing more people with good policy that seems good on the surface. And there's lots of those and there's a cumulative effect of all the good public policy. So there was kind of a challenge to our public officials at the table. Wow, we can look at that. But it's not just the public officials, it's also the private investors and the nonprofits that can come together and say, what are all those? Uh, unintended consequences that might be leading to this crisis. But the bottom line, I think everybody agreed was, act like a crisis if it is, or stop calling it a crisis and just put it on the agenda as normal. We are rested, relaxed, back from our comfortable furniture. Um, there were, the, our, our conversation pretty quickly went to um, we're assuming that we're still working on this growth pays for growth kind of model. And so we're kind of narrowly trying to figure out how to subsidize or change um, the, the impacts, right, of growth. And, and maybe part of solving this is, is about rethinking how those things get charged, how the, where they get assessed, how we, we pay for them as a community. Um, so that, that was one piece. Another uh, thing we talked about for a minute was the, um, uh, it's a regional competition up and down I-5, right? So the three planks we had there, there are other cities along I-5 who have similar planks. How do we sweeten, you know, sweeten it and make it interesting enough? And that's where we thought the regional collaboration could help. That we have to tell our story together and, and be welcoming and, you know, make, make sure that those those financial benefits, um, somebody takes the time to come see us and, and even hear that story. And, and the last thing we talked about was whether there are more flexible ways for municipal investment into projects. Um, that there, there are a lot of limitations and there's risks we don't want to take, but, um, but it sure seems like it's worth looking for how we might, the money's expensive, that's why. The, the equity capital is so expensive. What are ways to raise it? So, thank you. So, we had a lot of discussion at our table. Um, I'm just going to point out two of the main things that kind of relate to each of the questions we are focusing on. Um, one thing that came up was the use of um, underutilized um, government, city, county owned land, or opportunities there. So processes to see what kind of things can be um, created from, from that type of situation. And um, <clears throat> focusing on the question of what can an organization or a community do, one of the uh, ideas that we had was to, um, uh, in regards to education and trade skill type of education, and to bring more of that to, to the community so that we have more, um, more of that skill available. Uh, so we said um, in our group, uh, continuing conversations just like this is an integral piece, that sort of education piece where uh, people are not afraid to sort of show their cards uh, and, and have some of those honest and frank conversations with each other. Uh, and we also reached the conclusion that to be able to do that, we have to get past some of the politics and really be in a, a, a mindset of leadership. We're, we're in this room because we we can play a, a role as, as leaders. And so uh, leaders is not uh, politicking, uh, but, but, but finding solutions. Um, and it may not be, um, it's, it's governance, not necessarily ideologies that are gonna be able to solve some of that. Um, we also did like the, the idea of providing a different environment for these conversations. I thought it was worth noting that this conversation isn't happening in a city hall. Uh, this is, uh, it's not happening at a county courthouse. This is uh, neutral ground, if you will. So, uh, interesting piece. 
Um, we, we had the same concept concerning a design challenge, the idea of how can you uh, utilize uh, as underperforming assets or surplusable assets to uh, maybe issue a design challenge to, to address something like that. We also talked about um, the idea of don't be afraid to, to have a prototype emerge. I know if somebody brings a proposal and says, hey, here's how I think I could do this. Isn't it much easier to respond to a proposal or an idea than have to cook something up from scratch every single time? Um, we, uh, let's see, um, we had a, an idea about uh, investing. How does community investing work? Um, uh, oftentimes you can see um, that, there, that there are indexes out there that you can invest in. Let's say uh, it's a, you're an environmentally conscious person and you want to invest in, in a stock index that aligns with that, you're willing to take a lesser uh, return because it aligns with your ethos and, and, and that's okay. Can we create something like that locally uh, to address housing? Um, so we're investing into our own community uh, in housing and, and I have a feeling a lot of people would be willing to take a lesser return than what they would get on the stock market if they knew it was going into the economic wealth of their own community. Uh, so we played around with that idea and we, we'd like to explore that one a little bit more. the idea of regional collaboration with predictable expectations for developers. There was a pretty funny joke where someone said, why isn't Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater just one giant city? <laughs> we talked about why it's not. But the idea was that if, like Clark said, hey, as a region, we need to have one voice to attract people here. We're open for business. And, and so I thought that was, it was said in jest, but it was, you know, the concept was let's all coordinate, collaborate and try to attract people to our community together. <laughs> and um, there was some very, very specific detailed things with upzoning in our UGAs and our archaic annexation laws, kind of down to that level of detail. And then as far as what our individual organizations can do and what we can bring to the table, I think an interesting idea that we haven't talked about yet, but was mentioned a little bit on the panel, which is how do you connect the nonprofits with the private developers so if you're a private developer, you got to do 30% affordable housing. How are you managing that? That's where your nonprofits can come help and provide those support services, case management. What did, what did Trudy say? Enhanced property management. It's like a property manager who will give you a hug, tell you where to go get food stamps, and help you pay your rent, all that good stuff. So, <laughs> yes, thank you, Trudy. I really should stand up and just say, yeah, everything they said, um, and everything they said, and they said, um, we, we also talked about standardizing the regulations, because it, as a developer, being able to go from Lacey to Tumwater, to Yelm, to Olympia, and be able to know what your regulations are. But we also added one wrinkle. As a developer, it'd be nice to be able to go to the city and go, I'm applying for this loan, I'm looking at this RFP, what is going to be the total package of my fees? and not get them sprinkled down so you have to have a large contingency plan in your loan. And maybe you can use that money for other things. So work with the cities to be able to have a package, this is your fees. Um, someone even mentioned that potentially on some of the um, incentives that the city actually looks into providing a loan for the impact fees and some of these fees, because you might be able to do that at a lower interest than the bank will, so then the developer saves a little bit of money on their debt management. Um, so the offset, the other thing that uh, Andrew was talking about, to give him the full credit for this, is when a city gives an incentive, it has to come somewhere out of their budget. Be able to have work with the state to be able to have a fund that we can then turn around and apply for if we show certain markers and metrics that we use this offset money to provide housing and to increase our housing unit number and affordable housing in our city, then the state fund could uh, give us a little bit back so that our budgets don't get hurt and then the cities are more willing to put some of these incentives out there. 
Um, we also talked about how do we get the private sector and the public sector and the nonprofits all together working. And lastly, we did talk about what Kelsey said, because as an elected official, it's pretty tough to fight when all of the developers and those people can help us are being demonized as evil and one step out of hell. And um, I don't see that. I know that it has to be, and I think one of the things that has to happen from the elected officials, we have to keep saying they're, obvious, they're service providers, they're bringing us housing units. And then we have to look to our nonprofit groups and have them start parroting that too. It needs to come from many, many places or it's not gonna happen. start with the thing that we didn't talk about, but that I observed and other people talked about. This was an amazing discussion. Um, we had a developer, an elected official from Lacey, representative from our federal government, a uh, representative from private sector, an Olympic council member, um, our new, um, I can never read your title right, but Joshua Cummings from the county, um, basically the corollary to my boss, Keith Staley. You are the and um, a nonprofit developer. And I haven't seen very many of these discussions in a long time. I think incentivized housing brought it together, but um, the dialogue is just starting, and it was really powerful, and it was wonderful to see people sharing that, so just to reflect. Um, we started by talking about, like, how do, we, how do we balance the costs? You know, what are we saving on impact fees that we're not spending on homelessness? or um, the other costs of low-income housing because they impact our schools, they impact a, a broad array of other public expenditures. So, you know, what are the trade-offs there? Um, how do we spread the costs? Uh, we were talking about, you know, um, impact fees, fees that are loaded on this industry or on this consumer, um, and we're in a tax structure in this state that makes it very hard at the local level so, um, you know, how can we make those fees more equitable? Um, and, you know, once again, it's you know, one of the themes of the night. Um, developers need, um, are in this to make a living, um, and they need to make a profit. They need to keep their employees employed. Um, and, you know, sort of since you've introduced the, the concept of Hades, um, that leads into the next, uh, the, the next issue here is like we talked about, I think a lot of people talk about how developers are in one of the rings of fire. I think it's also fair to say that elected officials are forced into another ring of fire. Um, I leaned over to Rachel Young and uh, um, I asked, you know, what is Lacey thinking about possibly, you know, pursuing a missing middle? And I wouldn't say that her face went like this, but it's, it's scary. Our elected officials are in such a hot seat. Um, and that's, you know, when, when we expect the people who represent us, the people who build our housing, to endure that, um, we're in trouble. Um, and I think the last thing, we, we started talking about some of the, the underlying factors we don't always think about. There's a huge labor shortage in construction. Uh, they, we have a lot of people who were forced out of construction trades during the recession. Um, apparently they um, aged out and managed to find a way to retire, but they haven't been backfilled. Um, the developer who's at our table said um, that they, he's having a hard time finding employees. Um, so this, this, you know, all of these housing issues touch on a lot of other things, but education, pushing four-year schools, um, possibly at the expense of having trade schools. Um, you know, are, is it possible that we wrap up trade schools with four-year schools so people can get a trade and have the humanities to broaden their horizons? So um, my group was the most awesome group, I just got to say. <laughs> just got elected. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I have a lot to add. We spent a lot of time actually talking about challenges and particularly talking about challenges with um, seniors and with vulnerable populations and, um, uh, and how we were really struggling with that in terms of you know what to do. And without going through the meanderings of our conversation, at the end, we just started talking about maybe there's some other models that we should also be looking at, uh, such as home sharing, which Senior Services is kind of trying to experiment with a little bit with 
some seniors, but that has its challenges as well. Or perhaps um, design and build around this idea of community living, where multiple families share some common space, but then have um, their own space as well. Just kind of, you know, way out of our paradigm kind of ideas. And then we got cut short. <laughs> Thanks, Crosby. Our, our table also had a great discussion, and I thought we were the most awesome table. But uh, we talked about extending the multifamily tax exemption both geographically and its time horizon. Right now, it's limited to a maximum of 12 years. What happens after 12 years? The units become market rate. That's not a good thing, necessarily. Uh, we also talked about our missing middle process response to Ted's comments about, I never really thought about the price of not changing, that that has a cost and that it's quantifiable somehow, probably Ted's already got it all figured out, but uh, that's a really interesting com concept, that there is a cost for not changing. So thank you, Ted, for that. Uh, Zach's model is a great thing, and it's a great thing for municipalities to have that tool to be able to have these conversations, not just in real general terms, but in, in real terms. So thank you for that. Uh, 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 municipal uh, assets, we're looking at selling a piece of city property to foster affordable housing production. So all of those things. I would like to say thank you to Thurston Drives for pulling this event. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We're uh, one minute over our targeted time, and I want to be really conscious of that. But I do want to, uh, first off, uh, again, thank everyone for your time this evening. Uh, everyone is busy. We have busy lives, and I think uh, the effort and the conversation was quite worthy tonight. So thank you for that. Thurston Thrives, uh, we'll take this information, uh, all the conversations, and we will uh, provide that to the Housing Action Team. And they will take a look at it and look at their strategies and see where they align it, see if there are things that are missing or maybe a new twist on things. And we'll utilize that information to uh, um, define or redefine the strategies of housing within our community. Uh, I'd like to uh, also invite uh, Keith, thank you very much, for the Thurston Thrives plug. If, if you want more information or you want to have a conversation about Thurston Thrives and the collective impact uh, around our health and 
determinants of health. Uh, Crosby's right there, Crosby Carter, uh, and she's more than willing to spend some time, and we're more than willing to have you come to a coordinating council so you can see and, and, and hear and, and understand the types of work that collectively, as a community, a couple themes I heard, uh, partnerships, regional collaboration, flexibility, and continuing the conversation. So there is a platform, Thurston Thrives, that can help facilitate that and continue it. Uh, we will, as I mentioned at the beginning, produce a, uh, it won't be an overly refined piece, uh, but it will be a piece that you can take and continue conversations. You'll see the bullets, you'll see the, some of the report outs, and you'll, it will develop some themes for you. So, you get, so it'll be a, a piece that you can continue the conversation with. I do wanna, before we close things out, I wanna I want really thank all the partners here to, to, tonight, uh, the municipalities and uh, the county and all the staff from those organizations. If you could just stand, I'm gonna embarrass you. Stand, all staff. There you go. Thank you, thank you uh, for supporting. Thank you for supporting in the effort. It, it is most appreciated. And to close things out, if, if I do want to invite both the mayor, if she had any closing comments, and the commissioner, if he has any closing comments. Um, all I want to leave you with tonight is um, Amy Buckler had to leave early, and there's several of our staffers, and I'm sure Ann is part of this, um, that are going to be out on the streets of Olympia at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning doing a head count of people that are sleeping unsheltered in our city. The work that we did tonight is just beginning. And I hope that as we go into a housing summit three, four, and five, that those head counts come back and those start to go down so we can really show that we are moving the needle. So it's very important work, and I so appreciate you being here tonight because it's real. It's real. So thank you. Yes, uh, of course, I'd like to echo those things. So every single person in here has made a difference in some way or another and uh, is really uh, proven to be beneficial uh, for a community conversation. Um, but I mentioned the red, green, and blue team, but I forgot to mention that in 2019, we're gonna start a silver team because that's why Molly and I lean over there, raise your hand real quick. So it's something we're gonna do in the housing action team. Yep. Take care of the seniors. And um, the incentivized team is under that blue team, like I mentioned. We have uh, OMB that sits at the table, Zach that obviously sits at the table. Uh, who else is here that's from the uh, incentivized team? But it started with Jill. Jill came to me and said, I'm nonprofit and your government, and we're missing one piece here, and that's the uh, developers. And that's how that all got started two years ago. And we thank you immensely, Jill, for doing that. And I would like that you give you a round of applause for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and as David said, we're gonna take the reports and all the information, we'll come back, and, and there'll be a, a third or fourth and fifth, um, but it just started here tonight, and thank you very much.